Good morning. Good morning. Are you glad to be here? Those of you who are here, those of you who are watching, are you glad to be here? <laughs> I appreciate you all coming, and those of you who are able to make it today, and appreciate all of you who are joining us online on this April 18th. Is it, is it still winter? I haven't figured out quite yet if it's still winter or if we're actually moving into spring. I want to share a couple of things that are going on. One is um, leadership huddle is today. We have it once a month if you're not familiar with that at 1 p.m. today with Lisa. Lisa Kunke is doing our presentation. I think she's, I think it's centered around the value of, of, of voting and, and looking at some of the importance of our participation in that part of our lives. There's another one in, uh, in the following month is my spouse Lois will be doing one as well. Uh, we have these gatherings once a month to learn a little more about different aspects of, of life and ministry and, and things of interest. I invite you to just be in a moment of prayer with me as we come to this time of worship. God of, God of grace, we, we pause and just take a breath from this crazy world. As we breathe in your grace, we don't expect to pause from our responsibilities to be in this world. But we pause to gather in all that we can of who you are and how you shape us to be the people you want us to be. In this season of trying to understand what it means to be living the resurrection, we yearn for signs, for moments, for glimpses of your truth. Be with us this morning as we worship that we might come with our full selves, open to your guidance, to your leading, to your wisdom, and above all, to your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. I invite you to stand in body and in spirit as we join in our call to worship this morning. We are witnesses. We are witnesses of God's love. We are witnesses to everyone we encounter. Let us worship together as we sing our opening song of praise. At the font, we start our journey. One through ten. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple, called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Thank you. 
As we come to a time of prayer, I wanted to offer a word from the family of Bev Strom to you folks. Um, yesterday in Bern, Kansas, we had her graveside service. And um, the family has been very appreciative of all the prayers all this time for her. And I know a lot of you had probably been hoping to to have some kind of service and then being over two hours away, I realize that probably created some issues. But I wanted to share with you, uh, there's great joy and celebration of her life. And for those of you who have known Bev all these years, knew of her love of baseball and of the Royals, and you would be pleased to know that at the close of our graveside service, the uh, close friend of theirs who brought his guitar, we sang, take me out to the ball game spirited and all the family members had royals masks on that they had somebody in the family had made but i share that with you because i i want to keep us connected with those persons for whom we pray and the families that we are always connected with i invite you to be in a spirit of prayer when we are blinded by anger oh god you pour out your love for all to see when we wonder what tomorrow will bring, you call us to trust in you. When sadness fills our lives, you plant gladness in our hearts. God of Easter, touch us with your grace. You show us your hands so we may reach out to mend the broken. You show us your feet so we may walk with those the world passes by. You show us your face so we may know what our sisters and brothers look like. Risen Christ, touch us with your compassion. You open our eyes so we may see God's love. You open our minds so we may welcome God's word. 
you open our lips so we may be God's witnesses. Spirit of hope, touch us with your peace. God in community, holy and one, open us to your presence as we pray as Jesus has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Shout, shout, shout out my love for Jesus, for Jesus. I'm gonna shout, shout, shout out my love for God's most holy child. For whatever I might do today, at home, at work, at school, at play, I got Jesus' love deep down inside of me. Good morning. I've decided I'm going to have lunch here today. I brought it with me. Before I eat it though, I would thought I'd let you guess what I'm going to have and I'll give you some clues. Here's the first clue. Ah, did you guess bread? Yes. So I'm going to use the bread and make a sandwich. You're right. Okay. Now here's the next one. Do you know this? It's some butter. So I have two ingredients and I'm going to butter my bread and have a butter sandwich, which would be okay. Oh, oh dear. I forgot. I, I'm sorry. There's another element here. I'm going to have on my sandwich and you know, this is some cheese. So now I'm going to have a sandwich with cheese in it. Uh oh, wait a minute. I have this too. This is a frying pan. And if I have all these ingredients together, I'm going to make a, did you say it? A grilled cheese sandwich. Yes, I am. So I'm going to have a grilled cheese sandwich. When we make something that has more than one type of food in it, it's called a, a recipe. Every time I showed you what more of the things in my recipe, you were able to tell me what I was going to have for lunch. We see a similar thing happen in the disciples today's scripture story that Jesus is resurrection, but the disciples haven't seen enough of the resurrected Jesus to understand what that means. So Jesus helps them to see more in today's story. So here's the scripture from Luke. The disciples were still talking when Jesus himself suddenly stood among them. He said, may you have peace. They were surprised and terrified. They thought they had seen a ghost. Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? Why do you have doubts in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is really me. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have a body or bones, but you can see that I do. After he said that, he showed them his hands and feet, but they still did not believe it. They were amazed and still filled with joy. So Jesus asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of cooked fish. He took it and he ate in front of them. Jesus said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must come true. Now, I wanna think about that scripture. First, Jesus helped them to remember who he was. He showed them his scars and he ate with them. They probably had fish, they didn't have a, a grilled cheese sandwich. Then Jesus talked to them about the scripture stories from the Torah, which is our today, our scripture now is the Old Testament and help them understand the meaning of that. Then Jesus talked to them about turning their attention to God and to forgiveness. After all of that, Jesus then tells them, now that you understand and see what I've been telling you, you can go and tell others. So 
Remember how you had to see all the ingredients before you really knew what I was going to have for lunch? Jesus had to do the same thing with the disciples. He had to help them see how everything fit together before they could clearly tell others what they knew about Jesus. And guess what? It worked. The disciples went out and shared with people around them and that what they had learned and what they had seen with Jesus. And this is why 2,000 years later, we're still telling stories about Jesus and talking to each other about what Jesus taught. And the more we learn from Jesus, the stories, the more like the disciples we can be. Just like they did, we will be able to share and talk about these stories of Jesus with each other and with people around us. That's the good news for today. Let's pray. This is a repeat after me prayer. So you'll say that wherever you're at. Dear God, dear God, thank you for the disciples. Thank you for the disciples who shared everything, who shared everything. They saw and learned, they saw and learned from following Jesus, from following Jesus. Please help us, please help us to do the same thing, to do the same thing. Thank you and amen. Thank you and amen.
You could stay, remain standing for the reading of the gospel, or you can sit down. <laughs> it's short. <laughs> These are the words uh, from Mark chapter 6. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. May God bless the hearing and interpreting of those words. Thanks be to God and invite you to sit. Because <laughs> this will probably be longer. I'm just saying. Earlier, um, Linda had read the passage from the book of Acts. And the, one of the cool things about the book of Acts is there's so many different descriptions of what it, uh, of how, what the gospel described of frightened disciples hiding behind locked doors, how, those, how they came out of those locked doors and what they did and where they went and the kinds of things they achieved and accomplished. And in, in many ways, how they lived out the resurrection. Um, so I think there's a lot for us to learn about that. They went boldly out, going out and preaching and caring and healing. And um, that particular story documents the power of healing when Peter and John engage a man who has given up on healing, actually. A person who's been for years and years laying and asking for alms. Um, and no matter who came by, I'm sure he had different ways of asking for assistance, asking for giving and alms. And I don't know how many of you have encountered people on the street who are asking for things. Uh, many of them are pretty creative. I thought about it. I just tried to picture how would this modern, how would this look in a modern context? There'd be a lot of creativity about how you'd approach it and what thing you'd say, depending on the person you saw. I don't know if you, uh, I'll never forget when we were traveling in Israel years ago, there was a, a probably, a, I could not have been more than 10. I'm, it's hard to tell by his size, but a young man who had all these little things that he was trying to basically get you to buy, which were descriptions of the, the Via Dolorosa, you know, the way of, of the cross and how to travel it and all that and all sorts of information about it. And he turned to us and he says in English, you know, they only cost this much, you know, and he's talking to us. He immediately turned, talked to another couple and spoke in German to somebody else and talked Two seconds later, he turned around, spoke Italian, turned around, and I think it was Japanese, honestly. And I just thought, oh my goodness, this, 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 this kid's been doing this a while. And when I hear this story, I picture a person who's given up on healing and who this is their whole life, just sitting there asking people. And I mean, just, I tried to imagine what that'd be like. For me, that would be very difficult because you would obviously get bored saying the same thing over and over again, wouldn't you? I mean, I don't know, I just, this is a real tangent I'm going on here, by the way. And I think it's because some of you are here, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the, the thing that's interesting is, no matter how he asked for it, no matter what was running through his mind when he saw Peter and John come up, and he, he undoubtedly found one of his techniques to ask them for the usual. Ask them for the usual. But what he received was actually what he truly needed. He needed and experienced a moment of grace. And part of that story is of Peter reaching down and grabbing his hand and holding his hand and pulling him upright. There's this touch moment that happens. In the gospel, we hear this story of, of Jesus going to Gennesaret and all these people bringing everybody who needs healing to him. There's this sense that Jesus' power flows out through him. And, and the implication in the scripture, and we've heard this in other stories, is it even flows through the fringe of his, of his cloak. That that power of touch becomes the key to their healing in that story. That whole thought about that power of touch got me to remembering Years ago, there was a documentary on um, 
the large numbers of orphaned infants who have died, not for medical reasons, but because they had not experienced enough touch, enough intentional physical contact. Interestingly enough, the story was documenting that a lot of that happened at the height of the cleanliness movement, the discovery of germs, the discovery of how to sanitize, and, and they were the people who had these orphans were concerned, these infants were more, more concerned that they were gonna make them sick, that they would die of disease if they handled them too much. And it ends up, almost all of the children died from lack of being touched when they went back and reviewed it. The stark institutional isolation that was present, and at that time prevalent in those orphanages, probably mostly has melted away. But many babies and young children all over the world today still grow up in environments where touch and emotional engagement are lacking. I was thinking about it today that I worry about unaccompanied minors from toddlers to teens. The power of touch. Many children who have not had ample physical and emotional attention are at higher risk for behavioral, emotional, and social problems as they grow up. We know this. Now it's interesting, on the flip side, what we do know about touch in the positive sense is researchers have been discovering how emphasizing skin-to-skin -skin contact between baby and parent can be both a, a boon to, the, to both groups, that the parents need it too, mothers need it, the, the baby needs it, and how consistent emo emotional engagement with infants can speed their development and, interestingly enough, recognition of self. So touch obviously matters. Um, there are different kinds of touch. Good touch is what the world needs. And when we don't have good touch, sometimes bad touch comes into the picture. I was recalling a story <clears throat> I heard some time back of a, a woman, I think her name, as I recall, her name was, I was looking it up trying to remember, Ramona Pearson, I think was her name. She was 22 years old, and she had a coma for 18 months. And her family, she didn't stay in the hospital, her family put her in a care home. Uh, she'd had like 50 surgeries and she's in this recovery mode. And she was in this nursing home with a whole bunch of elderly folks. And the story goes on to describe how they took her on as she moved slowly out of her coma, even before she moved out of her coma, to be with her, to touch her, to talk to her, to embrace, you know, to, to be family to her in a way. And, and, and the story documents how that probably is what brought her out of it. <laughs> you know, it's all those folks uh, being present with her, touching her and encouraging her. Another story I recall, whenever I think about the power of touch, is Dr. Abraham Verghese did a TED talk some years ago about touch. And he shared the story. He was working a lot with HIV patients and he was working with a dying HIV patient who for the last time, knowing he was dying, went through the ritual of an opening up his shirt as though to be examined again, just so the doctor would touch him again before he died. It was part of his ritual. Sometimes I think our, our world has lost its link with good touch and the importance of good touch. And as a result, some people end up not being able to differentiate between them. Certainly today's scriptures are about good touch. I would say God touch, actually. And how important that contact is a representational nature of God's touch through us. I mean, I think some of us have experienced the power of being touched in a prayer for healing. Uh, I have to share that when I last met with Carrie Kirk, one of our beloved, uh, now deceased, long-term members, she was in a, a facility which we could visit, which was actually amazingly good. Had to wear masks and all that, but I'll never forget the last time I prayed with her shortly before she died. I stood at the bottom of her bed. Um, 
and I touched the blanket which covered her foot because I couldn't have access to the side. It was all blocked off. It was a way of saying, we still need to maintain some distance. But I managed to touch her covered foot as we prayed. It seemed small at the time, but it seemed like a vitally important act. Wearing a mask, blocked from her bedside, it made me begin to ponder how all our lives have been changed. I recall all these moments with touch because many of us have been living these past 14 months without enough intentional physical contact. Do I hear her name in? <clears throat> I am blessed to be in a family group, a bubble that includes people. That's not true of everyone. I understand that. What does it mean for us as we more move forward into the coming months and years of this health awareness that surrounds us? How do we live the resurrection in our current state of the world? What are the ways for us to overcome the absence of healing touch when we're almost required to for safety reasons? And what are those ways? I think those are the questions that are before us as the, as the people of God, as the, as the congregation of the faithful. Because we are called, we are, we are those who, who help people both touch and see the power of resurrection in our lives. That's, that's who we are, we're Easter people. Perhaps for a while our primary method is going to be through seeing rather than touching, I don't know. But let us not neglect as we move forward to ponder this and think about the power of healing touch, the God touch flowing through us, even if it's in a fist bump. Amen. Hey!
friends, go now from this place. You're the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus. Um, God works through us. Be creative, be wise, be loving, and be the touch that people need. Amen. Go in peace.